Okay, last topic, detectors. So in this lab and any optical system, it's typically important to have a good detector, especially if you're measuring the power or intensity of light. And so let's go through the different types of options you'll have. And this is important because if you ever build up an optical system, you go to a catalog and you'll find there's all these different types of detectors. Which one should I get? And so this will help you determine where you should at least start in your investigation. So one of the simplest detectors is a photoconductive detector. Basically, you've got some kind of photoconductive material. When you hit light on it, it generates carriers, electrons and holes. And so the more light, the more carriers you get. The more carriers you have, the lower resistance. And so you'll see this, basically you put a voltage and you'll see if you shine light on this, you'll get more current flow through because the resistance decreases. The main drawback is that the background current is always high. You always have, in these photoconductors, they always have some conductivity. So even if you have no light, your background current still exists. So if you want to measure just a tiny, tiny amount of light, it might not work because it won't be enough carriers generated to show an increase over the amount of background current already flowing through this photoconductor. The second type, which is better than that, is a photodiode, which is a dial that is typically reverse bias, biased, as shown in, the, uh, shown in the diagram here. Okay, And as a result, when you reverse bias a diode, you know that you get the reverse saturation current, which is very low. So this is already an improvement over a photoconductor because your background current's really low, meaning that it won't take many photons to increase the current. And so I'm not going to go through a ton of the details, but basically, you typically, for light applications, you use not a PN junction, but you use a PIN junction. And as a, with a PIN junction, the depletion region is wider because this is lightly doped, and so you get more depletion there. And so if I have light comes in here, it comes in, it's absorbed, it's got a larger area to be absorbed in, and then it can kick an electron up here, and that kicks a hole down here. The hole goes this way. The electron goes down this way with the electric field because the band bending is due to electric field. And as a result, you get carrier separation, and you can detect that in terms of increased current flow. So here's a typical PIN photodiode you might see. And you have the light absorption that matters is in between the P and the N type materials. You typically, again, you add a DC voltage source to reverse bias the diode, and that gives you the most linear response. So here's a diode in reverse bias here. So here's an IV plot for a diode, exponential and forward bias. And as I increase light, you can see that the amount of current increases proportional. So that's great because it gives you a nice linear proportional response that if you see the current double or triple, that means the amount of light on this has doubled or tripled. You typically feed this right into an amplifier. So you know, in this lab, you'll see this. This looks familiar, right? That's our photo detector. So the photo detector we have in this lab, it's a photodiode. But you just don't put this right into an oscilloscope or a voltmeter, right? It goes into that, the, uh, that handheld meter. That has in it an amplifier, which amplifies the current from the photodiode. And also sets the voltage for, such that it's going to give you a maximum uh, sensitivity, too. If you look at your responsivity versus wavelength, some of the meters in this lab will ask you to program in the wavelength. Why do they ask you to program in the wavelength? Why, is it, why, is, why does wavelength matter? Well, for a typical photodiode, like you can see for the silicon photodiodes, which we have in the lab, you can see the responsivity, which is how many amps you get out per watt of light in, increases, then peaks, and then decreases. So you need to program the wavelength of light. So when it gets this, you know, when it gets one milliamp of current, it knows how many watts that corresponds with. So the question is then, why does this have this curve like this? Well, first off, it goes up like this is for an ideal silicon photodiode. It goes up like this at first, because when you go to really short wavelengths, most of the energy that goes in there is greater than that, is, than that required to generate that electron hole pair. And so it just basically creates excess heat as it's absorbed. You only get one electron hole pair, but all this increasing photon energy doesn't give you any more current. It just gives you the same one electron and one hole generated. And so your amount of current generated per watt of light coming in goes down. So why does it fall off? Well, it falls off because this is the absorption. This is where the absorption coefficient for silicon starts to drop off because you're getting close to the band gap energy, where photons out here don't have enough energy to create that electron hole pair. So this is the key point. You have to know the responsivity if you want to get the exact amount of optical power coming in. 
And for the photo detectors in the lab, a lot of them will require, ask you to pro program in the wavelength so it knows when it tells you the, you know, it, so it can actually tell you the right reading of how many watts of light it's actually measuring. And again, if you want to go to different materials of the uh, different wavelengths, you need to get different materials. So if you look at uh, photodiodes and different uh, types of materials, you can go all the way from very short wavelengths all the way out into the infrared. Pick the right materials, and you can get very good responsivities that peak out where you want them to. And so this gives you some example material systems. If you go look up a photodiode, and let's say you need to be in the near infrared, go look, search Google for indium, gallium, and arsenide uh, photodiodes, and you'll find the materials you need. So, how can we do better than that? Well, one way to do that is to move from not from a photodiode, but to an avalanche photodiode, or APD. They're basically specially designed diodes that can handle a large reverse bias that gives you a ton of E-field, and there's so much E-field that when a photon comes in, it generates an electron in a hole, but those electrons experience so much energy that they can get to enough energy to excite another electron hole pair, and so on, same for the hole. So one photon could create one electron hole pair, which gets enough acceleration in the E-field to generate more electron hole pairs, so you get one photon resulting in multiple carriers out this. And so you can see here's your typical photodiode versus voltage. But if it was an avalanche photodiode, the responsivity here, or the current you get out, would increase if it's an avalanche photodiode as you get all this gain. So here you have a gain region where the amount of current you get out goes out orders of magnitude because of this amplification effect. Of course, if you put too much voltage on it, it'll turn up and blow it up into a puff of smoke. So you can see that here, where even with the regular this is the uh, dark current here, I'm sorry, this is where there's, this is the diode with no volt, no, cur no light applied to it, this is just the reverse saturation current, here you get to breakdown, here's where you shine light on it and you can see the photo current being uh, generated for this. If you really have to measure a tiny, tiny amount of light, then at that point you need a photomultiplier tube. They have higher, even higher amplification than APDs, okay? And so how it works is basically a photon comes in, and if it has enough energy, it can take an electron from the Fermi level in a metal, from the surface of the metal, and kick it up into vacuum. So basically strip an electron off of that. However, that's a little bit more difficult for most metals to do, and so how they help assist, assist that is here's the metal, and they put a very high voltage between these two surfaces, such that you're already trying to pull the electron off there. So reduce the amount of energy required to pull the electron off into vacuum. So this is a vacuum tube. And so what you see here is then that electron hits this other piece of metal, which also has a high voltage on it, and it multiplies and multiplies and multiplies and multiplies, eventually reaching the, reaching the anode here. And so how you get even voltage across all these metal plates is you put a very high voltage here, thousands of volts sometimes, that distributes because of these resistors across here. And again, the key point is you generate one photon, kicks off one electron, you get two, then six, then et cetera, et cetera, and then you get a ton of current out for that one photon. So it's multiple amplifications. One of the challenges with this approach is that if you shine too much light on this thing, all of a sudden you'll get so much light through this thing and so much current that it'll fry this, it'll break it. Same thing for APD. So it's very important that if you have a lot of light, you do not use a very sensitive photodiode because you'll get so much current that you'll burn it up. So it's not always good to go for the highest sensitivity if, you're, if you have a lot of light. Here's some key metrics. I'm not going to go through these in great, in great detail, but if you have to look up a photo detector, you need to understand, understand things like dark current, which is the background sort of intensity you have to deal with, noise equivalent power, um, responsivity we talked about, which is how many amps you get out for how many watts of light in, how quickly does it respond to light? So if you're doing a high-speed signal, what's the rise time? And sensitivity, which is important to things like bit error rate and things like that. If you're going to go buy photodiodes, here's a sil sil standard silicon photodiode. You can see here's a responsivity, 0.65, and it says it's good for high light levels, right? And so 0.65 there cost $22 from this cat. Here's an avalanche photodiode, gets more expensive. But the responsivity now, where's responsivity? It's 0.42, but it also has a gain of 50. And so that takes you up much higher, right? That takes you up to around 
20 compared to port 65 for the regular file dial diode. So more than an order of magnitude more responsive once you set it up appropriately, but it, at a cost. And again, not too much light because if you have too much light with this, you could fry it with too much current. And then you go to the most expensive photomultiplier tubes. You can see the responsivity becomes extremely high. Look how high the, amp the responsivity is. It's 10 to the fifth, over 10,000 amps per watt. It's pretty amazing. You can get up to a million um, for the gain you get out of these type of systems. Okay, but again, I think it'll say it'll say somewhere on here. Warning: This product is extremely light sensitive, meaning that if you expose the aperture to room light, it could permanently damage the product. And so, you know, this is more expensive, and only use it for really low light level detection. That's it. Done with photo uh, emitters and detectors, and we'll see you in uh, in lecture and in in the uh, the quiz section and in lab.